Welcome and thank you for standing by. I would like to inform all participants that your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. Today's call is being recorded. If anyone has any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Deborah Riviera. Thank you. You may begin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Academy webinar series webinar. Uh, my name is Deborah Rivera, and I'm a training specialist for the Census Bureau. I'd like to give everybody a warm welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today and showing us your interest in all things Census Bureau. So our topic for today is an introduction to U.S. Census Bureau data. My role here today is I will be providing technical support to our speaker throughout the session. I will also be managing and monitoring the chat which if you haven't been able to locate it yet, it is on the right-hand side of your WebEx event screen. So a few housekeeping items before we get started, as usual. We are recording this webinar, and along with all of the training materials associated with it, any transcripts, PowerPoint presentations, um, or any supplemental materials, all of that will be posted to our Census Academy site as a free learning resource under recorded webinars. I'll make sure to send that link through the chat as well so you guys can find it easily. Um, we are going to have an, a question and answer session that will take place towards the end of the presentation, but we do encourage you to use the chat feature if you, if you prefer to submit your questions um, in written form. Um, just very important, make sure that when you do send your questions uh, from the drop-down menu in the chat feature that you select all panelists so we can all see your questions and also your feedback. We accept feedback through the chat as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Ms. Anna Maria Garcia. Anna Maria Garcia has worked for the U.S. Census Bureau since 1999, and during her tenure, she has held the following positions. She's been a partnership specialist in the Boston region, a local census office manager in Hartford, Connecticut, and a partnership coordinator and data dissemination specialist in the New York Regional Office. Um, currently in her role as a data dissemination specialist, Ms. Garcia is responsible for providing instruction to community groups, staff of elected officials, government agencies, and the general public on how to access Census Bureau data. Ms. Garcia is bilingual and she provides instruction in both English and Spanish, and she is responsible for the geographies of Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Puerto Rico. Ms. Garcia also holds a JD from Temple University. It is a pleasure to introduce you, Anna Maria. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. So good morning to all. As you've heard, I'm Anna Maria Garcia, and I'm going to be conducting today's webinar. So let's start with the um, objectives of the webinar. First, I'd like you to leave with an understanding, a basic understanding of the breadth of the data collected uh, by the Census Bureau, because we collect quite a bit of data, um, that you understand census geographic levels, that you can distinguish the difference between the American Community Survey and the decennial census, and that you become familiar with some American Community Survey topics. So let's uh, look at the agenda. So I'm going to first give you a brief overview of the U.S. Census Bureau. Then we'll explore some of the surveys and censuses conducted by the Census Bureau. We'll take a deeper look at the American Community Survey, which is our largest demographic survey, and explore some of its various geographic levels. And finally, we'll go live to census.gov on our landing page. So an overview of the Census Bureau. Census Bureau has been um, headquartered in Suitland, Maryland for over 75 years, um, actually since 1942. We have a staff of approximately 4,200 permanent members, and we have now grown to several hundred thousand temporary employees that help us conduct the 2020 Census. The Census Bureau is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, and overseen by the Economics and Statistics Administration within the Department of Commerce. The Economics and Statistics Administration provides high-quality economic analysis and forces the mission of the U.S. Census Bureau. 
USS Bureau is the federal government's largest statistical agency. We are dedicated to providing current facts and figures about America's people, its places, and its economy. Federal law protects the confidentiality of all the information the Census Bureau collects. So we conduct a couple of censuses, a decennial census, an economic census, and the census of government. Let me talk briefly about each one of them. So the decennial census, we're most known for conducting the decennial census every 10 years. It's at once the decade population and housing count of all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the island areas, as required by the U.S. Constitution. The results of the decennial census determine the number of seats for each state in the House of Representatives and are used to draw congressional and state legislative districts and to distribute more than $675 billion in federal funds each year to local communities. That's correct, $675 billion in federal funds each year. It helps the government decide how to distribute funds and assistance to states and localities. It's also used to draw lines of legislative districts and reapportion the seats in each, for each state um, in Congress. Also known as the Population and Housing Census, the decennial census counts every resident in the United States. It is mandated by Article I, Section 2 of the Constitution, and takes place every 10 years, years ending in zero. We have already begun data collection for the 2020 Census in remote areas of Alaska. The Census tells us who we are and where we are going as a nation and helps our community determine where to build everything from schools to supermarkets and from homes to hospitals. Let's look at the economic census. Every five years, years ending in two and seven, the U.S. Census Bureau collects extensive statistics about businesses that are essential to understanding the American economy. This official count, that are known as the economic census, serves as the foundation for the measurement of U.S. businesses and their economic impact. This business census serves as the most extensive collection of data related to business activity. Nearly 4 million businesses, large, medium, and small, serving most industries and in all geographic areas of the United States receive surveys tailored to their primary business activity. The data produced in the economic census are important to industry, our communities, and businesses. Policymakers are provided evidence-based information used to make sound programmatic decisions. Federal agencies rely on the data as the basis for key measures of economic activity, such as the gross domestic product, the GDP, or the national income and product accounts, the NIPAs, and the producer price index, the PPI. Trade and business associations, along with chambers of commerce, rely on economic census data to measure key business facts they can use to gauge uh, organizational structure and product trends. And individual businesses use the data from the economic census to make decisions about operating sites, capital investments, and product development. And let's look at the census of government. The census of government identifies the scope and nature of the nation's state and local government sector. It provides authoritative benchmark figures of public finance and public employment. It classifies local government organizations, their powers and activities, and measures federal, state, and local fiscal relationships. It is taken every five years, also years ending in two and seven. And it is in Title 13, Section 161 that requires that this census be taken. And it covers all state and local governments in the United States. And by local governments, it includes all counties, all cities, all townships, all school districts, and any special districts such as 
is a water district, um, a fire district, a library district that you may have in your community. Let's look at the surveys that we conduct. And we conduct demographic surveys, economic surveys, and what we call sponsored surveys. The U.S. Census Bureau conducts more than 130 surveys each year, including our nation's largest household survey, the American Community Survey, which we'll subsequently discuss. So let me um, talk about demographic surveys. Demographic surveys um, measure income, poverty, education, health insurance coverage, housing quality, crime victimization, computer usage, and many other subjects, which we'll take a look at in a subsequent slide. The American Community Survey is one such survey. Another de demographic survey is the National Crime Victimization Survey, or NCBS. It's sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is the nation's primary source of information on criminal victimization. This survey collects data measuring the types and amount of crime involving people aged 12 or older. Periodically, the survey includes additional topics such as um, crime in schools, contacts with law enforcement, and identity theft. So why is this survey important? Well, data from this survey are used to provide information on many topics related to crime and victimization, including crime in schools, trends in violent crime, cost of crime, and the response of law enforcement to reports of victimization. Now let's look at some of the economic surveys. They are conducted either monthly, quarterly, or yearly. They cover selected sectors of the nation's economy and supplement the economic census with more frequent information about the economy. So these surveys yield more than 400 annual income reports, or economic reports, including uh, principal economic indicators. Included in this group is County Business Pattern, CBP, which is an annual series that provides subnational economic data by industry. This series includes the number of establishments, employment during the week of March 12th, and the first quarter payroll and annual payroll. This data is useful for studying economic activity of small areas, analyzing economic changes over time, and as a benchmark for other statistical series, surveys, and databases between economic censuses. So it provides us that data between those five years uh, when the economic census is conducted. Businesses use the data for analyzing market potential, measuring the effectiveness of sales and advertising programs, setting sales quotas, and developing budgets. Government agencies use the data for administration and planning. Other economic surveys are the Annual Survey of Manufacturing's Paid Employees, which provides sample estimates of statistics for all manufacturing establishments with one or more employees. Sponsored surveys. These are demographic and economic surveys that we conduct for other government agencies. They include the Current Population Survey, the National Health Interview Survey, and the National Survey of College Graduates, um, just to name a few. So let's look at the Current Population Survey, or CPS, as it's better known. It's sponsored by the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the primary source of labor force statistics for the population of the United States. The Current Population Survey is one of the oldest largest, and most well-recognized surveys in the United States. It is immensely important, providing information on many of the things that define us as individuals and as a society, our work, our earnings, and our education. In addition to being the primary source of monthly labor statistics, the CP 
GPS is used to collect data for a variety of other studies that keep the nation informed of the economic and social well-being of its people. This is done by adding a set of supplemental questions to the monthly basic CPS questions. Supplemental inquiries vary month to month and cover a wide variety of topics, topics such as health insurance coverage, child support, volunteerism, and school enrollment. Supplements are usually conducted annually or biannually, but the frequency and recurrence of a supplement depend completely on what best meets the needs of the supplement's sponsor. Another sponsored survey is the National Health Interview Survey, NHIS. It's a national survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau on behalf of the National Center for Health Statistics. The National Health Interview Survey, NHIS, is the principal source of information on the health of the civilian non-institutionalized population of the United States and is one of the major data collection programs of the National Center for Health Statistics, which is part of the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. Another sponsored survey is the National Survey of College Graduates, NCS, and SCG, which is a biannual survey of college graduates residing in the United States that has been conducted since the 1970s. The National Survey of College Graduates is sponsored by the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics at the National Science Foundation. The survey began oh, in the 1970s and has been conducted approximately every two to three years. The survey provides data on the number and characteristics of individuals with a bachelor's or higher degree with a special focus on individuals with education or employment in science or engineering. The, the National Science Foundation uses this information to prepare congressionally mandated biannual reports such as women, minorities, and persons with disabilities in science and engineering and science and engineering indicators. These reports enable the National Science Foundation to fulfill its legislative requirements to act as a clearinghouse for the current information on science and engineering workforce. The survey also serves some other purposes. Government agencies use this data to assess the college educated resources available in the U.S. to businesses, to industry, and to academia and to provide a basis for the formulation of the nation's education and employment policies. Education institutions use the data in establishing and modifying scientific and technical curricula. Employers in all sectors of education, industry, and the government use the results to understand trends in employment opportunities and salaries in all fields and to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, uh, equal opportunity efforts. So you can get to see that in each one of these types of um, surveys, we're servicing a great need that um, our community is using to inform programs, policy, decision making, and so forth. Now I want to look at uh, our largest demographic survey, which is the American Community Survey better known as ACS. We at the Census Bureau sometimes speak in alphabet. I'll try very hard not to do that. So the American Community Survey is an ongoing annual survey that shows what the U.S. population looks like and how it lives. The American Community Survey helps us, uh, all of our communities decide where to target services and resources. It provides vital information on a yearly basis about our nation and our people. Information from the survey generates data that help determine how more than $675 billion in federal and state funds are distributed each year, which I mentioned in a prior slide. Through the American Community Survey, we know more about jobs and occupations, educational attainment, veterans, whether people own or rent their homes, and other topics, we 
which we'll take a look at subsequently. Public officials, planners, and entrepreneurs use this information to assess the past and to plan for the future. When you respond, you respond to the American Community Survey. You're doing your part to keep your community plan for hospitals and schools, support school lunch programs, improve community survey services, build bridges, and inform businesses looking to add jobs and to expand to new markets and more. The American Community Survey helps local officials, community leaders, and business understand the change that's taking place in their communities. It is the premier source of detailed population and housing information. So now on the screen, what you see on the right is the, a sample of the questionnaire that's sent out to the American Community Survey. And as indicated uh, on the slide, um, it is current, it's reliable, and it's accessible data. And it covers a range of topics from commuting to income to educational attainment and others. Um, and each year we, we, we survey about 3.5 million households. And in addition, we visit um, 20,000 group quarters. That's where people are living all together, hospitals, um, uh, college dorms, um, nursing homes, um, prisons like that. Those are what we call group quarters. And so we visit about 20,000 uh, group quarter facilities. And within those facilities, we sample approximately 194,000 residents each year. In the, in the American Community Survey um, covers over 35 topics and informs about 300 evidence-based federal government users and producers. So this is, this is where it becomes really expensive, and it produces 11 billion estimates each year. I'm going to see that 11 billion estimates each year are produced from the American Community Survey. And we produce three releases. We do a one-year release which is for large populations, and by large populations, we mean those um, areas that have 65,000 or above in their um, you know, uh, geography. We have the one-year supplemental estimates for smaller populations. Those are populations from 20,000 to 64,999. And then we have a five-year estimate for very small populations, for all populations below 20,000. So we produce um, these releases three times a year. And what you can see um, here is a bit about um, the history of actually the census and the American Community Survey. And I bring in the census because it, from, from my perspective, to understand what the American Community Survey is, we need to discuss a bit about census history. So as you can see in this chart, the first census of the United States was conducted in 1790. And it occurred every 10 years with one form being used to collect data from all households from 1930. So from 1790 to 1930, we used one form to collect um, data from the households. And then from 1940 to 2000, um, the decennial census uh, contained both a short form and it contained a long form that was used to collect data from sample households. So the, uh, for the long form was not sent to every single household. It was sent to a sampling of households. And the long form served its purpose for quite some time. However, it became less and less useful as communities were changing throughout the decade. And so we heard in the early 1990s a demand from a wide variety of uses um, 
for current nationally consistent lead, uh, consistent data. So it led federal government uh, policymakers to consider a feasibility of collecting social, economic, and housing data continuously throughout the decade. So in 2000, a large-scale demonstration of the American Community Survey was conducted. And in 2005, the American Community Survey was fully implemented and began collecting data for all of America's communities each year. So now we have data available on an annual basis, and we don't have to wait for that demographic data every 10 years. There's also a Puerto Rico Community Survey, PRCS, which is the equivalent of the American Community Survey in Puerto Rico. And so from 2010 and moving forward, the decennial census is only a short form sent to all households because now we have uh, the availability of the American Community Survey, which collects information each year that was once collected every decade. And in this slide, what you get to see is the difference um, between the American Community Survey and the census. So I'm going to start on the left side of the screen. Um, uh, not on the left, yeah, we, we let's start on the right side of the screen. So the census, is the census, uh, its purpose is to count. What we want to do is count every single person living in the United States. And what we produce are population totals. And we produce this every 10 years. We're actually getting ready or been getting ready for some time for the 2020 census, which will be occurring in April of 2020. And it's a point in time, the question will be, uh, were you living at this address on April 1st? And it just provides information from the short form, your race, uh, your age, um, Hispanic origin or not, like that. So it will provide data based on the 10 questions that are asked. As distinguished from the American Community Survey on the left side, which gives a sample estimate. So these are not actual numbers, but these are estimates. Um, and it gives us population characteristics because of the breadth of uh, demographic data that we collect. And it's collected every single year, as distinguished from every decade. Uh, and it's a period in time, so that one year estimates that are produced give us 12 months of data, and that five-year estimate gives us 60 months of data. And it, what it collects is the information that was previously um, collected in the long form. So you get to see the difference. One is the count done every 10 years, and the ACS, the American Community Survey, actually gives us data that add some dimension to that count. It gives us a picture of what those communities look like. So let's look at um, some uses of the American Community Survey. So in this example, what I wanted to demonstrate um, was that the American Community Survey can be used for market research. Uh, here, a child care provider in Connecticut um, wants to understand the potential of students enrolling in their program offerings. Right? So where they started was they wanted to know and learn about the number of three to four-year-olds by census tract in Fairfield County. So that was their starting point. And having that information, they could then determine uh, residents of a different age, sex, or family in these locations. Yeah, because now they can determine which families have three and four year olds, and they could use that to target their marketing to. They could look at if any changes in employment or earnings have occurred in these census tracts. Maybe guiding them to where they can market um, their programs based on affordability. They can also ask 
of any changing demographics in these census tracts? Do residents speak a different language that informs their programming? And also with the rise of computer and internet uses, uh, it provides them the opportunity of um, targeting the customers that they want to reach. And what you see on the right hand is a map of all census tracts within Fairfield County. So whenever you seek data on the American Community Survey, you'll be able to map that information as well. And so you get to see the various users people are, are using the American Community Survey for. Now let's look at, we talked a bit, and I actually mentioned a bit about the topics. Um, so these are, these are not the 35 plus topics, but what I pulled out was some of the same topics. And you can see on the left, on the population side of this chart, um, that we have three sort of main buckets, social, demographic, and economic. So we gather that type of data from the American Community Survey. So in social, you'll have questions like educational attainment. You'll have information on disability. You'll have information on grandparents, grandparents as caregivers. Okay? You'll have uh, information on language spoken in people's homes, um, how people are mi migrating across the country from area to area. Uh, we'll look at some school enrollment, and you can look at some veteran data. So these are some of the social data points that are collected in the American Community Survey. And under demographic, you'll see them right there, your age, Hispanic origin, race, the household relationship, um, and the sex of the person who is responding to the questionnaire. And then you have um, that economic set of uh, data that we collect. Um, commuting, for instance, how long does it take you to commute? How do you commute to work? Do you commute to work in a carpool? Is in a carpool? How many people are in the carpool? That's how granular we can get in the data. It'll ask you about your employment status. Are you working or are you not? Um, health insurance, do you have a health insurance or not? Um, your income, the industry and occupation that you um, Working. So you start to see that a lot of this information begins to give us a picture and an understanding of particular communities throughout the country. And then on the right hand side, you're going to see um, questions that we ask about housing. And so in, in the questions about housing, we'll ask about your home value. Is this housing unit occupied or vacant? What's the tenure of the housing unit? And by tenure, we mean do you own or do you rent it? What are you, the utilities that are available in this housing? Uh, what are the number of vehicles that are associated with this housing? You know, what type of heating fuel do you use? And so some people you know, wonder why we ask these questions. Remember, we conduct this survey across the nation so there's, there are some areas um, that the heating fuel is very different. So you might want to be thinking, or planners might want to be thinking of installing gas lines around because there is no um, gas fuel in a particular area. Okay. Um, the occupancy rate, whether it's vacant or it's um, occupied, you know, informs about what potential there might be for either purchasing homes or um, employment opportunities. If there is a lot of vacant homes, the employment opportunities are far less. So I wanted you to see the, um, the type of data that's included in the American Community Survey. And here on this slide, what we get to see is those three releases that I mentioned earlier. So that one-year estimate, that 12-month of data, is for geographies of 65,000 or more. That's going to include all of your states, um, 
many of your counties, um, some of, uh, all of the large above 65,000 um, cities and that. The one-year supplement estimates um, include geographies of 65,000 or more and geographies of 20,000 and above. Um, and will be, and we just released that on February 6th of 2020. And the five-year estimates, which is a compilation of 60 months of data, um, is available at all of the geographic levels, at the, the largest 65,000 and above, at the smaller population, 20,000 to 64,999, and anything less than uh, 20,000. And we just released that, the 2018 five-year estimate on December 19th. And why would we do a one-year estimate and a five-year estimate? Well, we do that because if in your plan or in your research you want to compare a census tract, for instance, which will not be more than 8,000 people, and you want to compare that census tract to the county in which it resides, you would have to use a five-year estimate and possibly a one-year estimate if that count is above 65,000. And we don't encourage uh, you to, um, actually, we, we encourage you not to compare uh, different estimates, a one-year and a five-year. We ask you to compare the same estimates, um, the similar estimates like the five-year, because they're the same sample size. And so the data will not be um, so if you're comparing a census tract and a state, we'd ask you to look at the five-year estimates for those geographies. And so this is the information on the three releases. I've given you a URL at the bottom of the screen if you want to know more about the three different types of releases. This is where you can gather that information. So let's look at census geography. So it looks like a very busy um, slide, and it is busy. But let me draw your attention to the spine, to the center of this graph. So it starts at national data, drops down to regional data, the state data, the counties, and then to what uh, is known as census geography, census tract, block groups, and census box. Okay. And I want to go through, um, and these are not all the ge geography that we, um, that we covered, but this is a sampling of what we do. So if you look at the national data, you see some geographies in blue with lines underneath it. And so one of them that I want to highlight is the zip code tabulation area on the right-hand side. And so those are areas um, representing the Postal Service five-digit zip code service areas um, that the Census Bureau creates using whole blocks to present um, statistical data from censuses and surveys. And we define victims by allocating each block that contains addresses to a, uh, to a single victim usually to the zip code that reflects the most frequently occurring zip code. So again, so they're assigned to a zip code because most, the most frequently occurring zip code for the addresses within the, within the tabulation block appear there. And they have a population of 100,000 or more. So that's your zip code, if you will. And there's other uh, areas like the metropolitan urban areas and American Indian, which we could um, discuss either in a question that you might have, or I can send you uh, somewhere that you can actually get additional information about the geography that the American Community Survey covers. And under nation, right, you see regions, and regions are groupings of states and the District of Columbia that subdivide the United States um, for presentation of census data. And there are four regions, the Northeast, 
the Midwest, the South, and the West. And those are usually used for um, planners who are looking for data uh, to develop either highways, uh, railroads, and that kind of thing that will cross state lines. So regional data is very useful to them. Under regional data, we have state data, which includes all 50 states. And under, under the states, we've highlighted places. And places are your cities and towns that are incorporated. So they'll include the cities and towns that are incorporated. And they'll also include what we call census designated places or CDPs, which are unincorporated. They have no size thresholds. They're separate and distinct from the city and the town. And they redefined each census. So you want so when you're looking at places in geography, you'll see um, the geography and then um, parentheses CDP. That you'll know that that's not the full incorporated city or town. And then we'll um, drop down to county. And that includes every single county um, within the United States. And then if we go further, we now start looking at census geography. So you have census tracts. And census tracts are, as we say here, they're very small. They have between 1,200 and 8,000 population. And the optimum size of, from the Census Bureau perspective is 4,000. So if uh, census tracts becomes more populated than 8,000. At some time, we split it, and you'll see a demonstration of that in a subsequent uh, slide. And a census tract also includes anywhere between 480 to 3,200 housing units. So that's the, that's the largest census geography. And then under census tracts, we have block groups. Block groups are smaller. They're anywhere from 600 to 3,000 uh, in population, and they have anywhere from 240 to 1,200 housing units. Right? And block groups is the smallest level of geography that you can get in the American Community Survey. Right? Um, but I've also included census blocks, because we were talking about the decennial because census blocks are only available during a decennial. And block, census blocks are not defined by population and are the smallest geographic level at which data is ever released, and that's during the decennial census and not the ACS. So uh, in this next slide, what you're going to see is how geographies um, nest with each other. So if you look on the right-hand side, you have block 3001 with its boundaries marked. Right? So block 3001 is joined by block 3002 all the way to 3005. And that cluster of blocks becomes known as a block group. And it actually becomes block group 3 because it assumes the first number of the block. So this is block group three. And if we look up at census tract uh, above, we'll see that several block groups have joined together to form a census tract. So we have block group one, we have block group two, block group three, and block group four, all creating a census tract. That census tract then becomes part of a county. And you can see that depicted um, in green counties. A green county includes census block um, from 101 through 107. And on this, you can also see census block 102.01 and 102.02. So at some point, census block 102 became populated more than 8,000, so a split was made. And that, that 0.01 and 0.02 demonstrates that split. If you 
were looking for a geography in a large city, um, like a New York City, for instance, you might find a census um, with 0.13, 0.14, because the density of population has increased so much, they had to be split several times. So I wanted you to get a picture of how the geography actually starts forming um, a puzzle, which then keeps building up until we have census tracts for the entire country. And we can see that uh, and then provide data for you at all of the geographic levels um, that were um, shown on the previous one, except for the block, which is only done during the decennial. And in this one, this just depicts that we have, uh, we provide for users also maps that can map out the boundaries of the particular geography that they're looking for. Uh, and in this one, it's um, actually census tracts that are being depicted. And these areas are defined primarily for data tabulation and for presentation purposes. So here you get uh, a presentation of data um, of uh, census tracts within an area. So now I want to look at uh, briefly at how it is that we access census data. So what I would recommend, and I recommend very strongly to anyone wanting to access American Community Survey data, that you go to the website, and I provided you a link to the website at the bottom of the screen. You know, the website provides much information about the survey, and as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, it tells you about the survey, how to respond to the survey, data in the survey, um, geography in, in the American Community Survey, its technical documentation, and so on. So it's a place that one can get information and get the context of the American Community Survey before we start looking at the data. I find it to be extremely helpful. I would recommend that anybody looking for American Community Survey actually use uh, this website. And then we also have um, quite a number of tools that display the American Community uh, Survey data. And so you see a couple of them here. This is not all the tools, but I want to highlight um, three of them for you. So we have the Census Builder, which is the one that's demonstrated all the way at the bottom on the right of the screen. And Census Builder provides um, selected demographic and economic data. Um, and it has two versions. It has the Small Business Edition and the Regional Analyst Edition. Small Business Edition uh, is primarily, primarily for small business owners who need key data for their businesses, for their business plan, or to better understand potential markets. It presents data for a single type of business at a time. The Regional Analyst Edition is primarily for Chambers of Commerce and for regional planning staff who um, need a broad portrait of the people and businesses in their service area. It presents data for all sectors of the economy and for a user-defined region made up of one or more areas. So that's your census business builder, a pretty um, informative tool for the two audiences I just described. And then um, if you look above the census builder on the left-hand side, you'll see my congressional district. So my congressional district, what the census bureau has done is taken drawn all the lines of the congressional district and pulled up the data for the district. So you'll be able to see um, social data, economic data, educational data, business data, specifically for the um, uh, congressional district in which you're interested. And how this tool works is when you get to it, you um, are given the option of clicking a state. You click a state, a map of the state shows up, and then you can select whichever congressional district that you want 
was neglected the congressional district is highlighted you can see it here in yellow in the center of the blue um, congressional district and then you can get to see all of the data for that particular congressional district and then the last one right beneath it is uh, data.census.gov it's our newest platform to access data um, and the vision for the data disseminating, I say the vision because it's not fully uh, rolled out completely yet. Uh, the vision is that through data.census.gov, um, we improve your the customer experience by making a, you know, data available from one centralized place so that data users um, spend less time searching for data and more time using it. So those are three of the um, tools that one can use. But I've given you, again, a URL at the bottom of the screen where you can see the myriad of tools that are available and explore them for your uh, particular use. This is data.census.gov. I wanted to highlight it separate from the others because um, it is our newest tool. And so we are encouraging people to go and actually use it, try to find data, and give us feedback. Because how it's being rolled out is um, we roll out a functionality, and then people test it and give us feedback. We take that feedback, make any uh, updates that are recommended, and then we roll it back out again so that throughout the entire development of the tool, you, the user, are involved in informing the process of how the final tool is going to uh, look like. So it's data.census.gov, and this is what the screen um, will look like um, on your computer. And you'll have uh, the opportunity to either search by that I'm looking for, which is the single search bar, or right underneath it, not depicted here on this screen, but right underneath it, you can do an advanced search, which lets you filter information by topic, by geography, by year, and that such. Here I wanted to point to um, ways that you can um, subscribe for information. We have data gems, those short vignettes that teach you how to do a particular subject without having to participate in a complete webinar, and if you sign up for those, um, you'll get them delivered right to your um, inbox that says here. Um, you can get information on data courses, because there are some data courses that are being um, developed through the Census Academy. Um, you can interact with instructors via webinars, such as we'll have a question and answer period towards the end. Um, and if what you want is, um, session either either in person or um, via webinar, um, you can request it. And you can request it by emailing census.askdata at census.gov. And then um, that request will be worked on and sent to an individual who can provide it. And what I want to stress that the workshop presentations or anything that's done, it's free of charge to you, it's a service that we provide. Um, and then we ask you to share, give us feedback on ideas of topics that you want covered in webinars or specific data gems that you might want to um, see and learn from. And then here what I wanted to show you was that, um, you know, we talked about geography quite a, um, a bit. And so the geography uh, division has put up interactive maps that will demonstrate the data for you. Um, and so I've given, uh, provided another uh, URL at the bottom so you can get to the interactive map and see the, the values that seem the data not only on a sheet, but then are in a map actually brings um, to your presentation. You know, we talk about the American Community Survey, and we want, we want really people to know about 
the impact that the data collected from the American Community Survey is having in communities throughout the United States. So we're asking people to share their stories. Tell us your story. You know, you had a need in your community. You look for some data, and then you put in a grant or you, you know, you applied for some funding. Um, and then tell us the outcome. You receive the thing, and now what's available within the community. Right? We want to publish those stories and let them be known so that other people who are not familiar with the American Community Survey can begin to access some of the data and make changes within their communities. So we encourage your stories. And then here are ways that you can stay current with what's happening. There's a newsroom, which will give you all of the releases, uh, America Counts, which is, uh, features stories on various topics. There's uh, the director's blog, so you can read um, what's on his mind, given the mammoth responsibility that he has. And then we have Facts for Stories, which is where we um, actually published what I just mentioned to you in the previous slide, um, the impact of how using um, our data actually um, impacts communities. And then there's a, here are a myriad of ways that one can stay connected. Right? And if you have uh, an inquiry uh, and you're non-media, there's a particular number you call, the 800 number. And if you are a media uh, person, um, then the number is to the Public Information Office. And you can follow us through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and so on. So we want people to stay connected and learn about all the things that we are covering at that particular moment. And then this is my contact information. So you heard earlier on the geographies that I cover. Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. I don't think Maine was included because it's a new geography that I've been assigned, but Maine uh, in Puerto Rico. So if you want any information or need any support in information for those geographies, then contact me, Anna Maria Garcia. Uh, there's my phone number and my email address, okay? And I promise you that uh, if you send me an email, I will respond if you call me we can have a wonderful conversation about the data that you're looking for and how best to seek it. If you're looking for information for some other areas, you, we suggest that you uh, contact the toll-free number, the 1-844 number, 275-2342, or send uh, the request to census.gov, ask data at census.gov. Um, a person will see the request and then forward it to the appropriate person, and that will get your request um, for training or for stats, you know, for statistics or any of that information that you might want. We'll get the ball rolling when you put in the request. And so what I'd like to do now is first and foremost, thank you profoundly for your interest in census data. It's a lot, um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, there'll be uh, some slides and recording for your use um, because there's some things that you might forget. Uh, and so this will sort of refresh your memory. And um, if you're interested in follow-up information, I'd be more than glad to entertain um, a phone call or an email from you. But at this point, we'd like to open it up to questions. We will now begin our question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one from your phone, unmute your line, and speak in when prompted. Now our first question comes from James. Your line is open. Um, with regard to that uh, track tool um, data gathering, um, it, it, does it have its own tab that you enter when you're searching with that method uh, from the actual uh, ACS website? 
Right. Um, you can actually, when you're selecting, because you'll select geography, right? Uh, and there is the the ability to, to select census tract, and then it's going to ask you census tract like where, because we have them all over the country. And then you start, you know, refining it, and so we'll get to the census tract, uh, the particular census tract or census tracts that you're interested in. So yes, you can do that. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I had a crash course uh, with our local representative here in Coeur d'Alene the other day, but I forgot how we said it. And uh, and so thank you for that information because I know I know I select geography first. <laughs> thank you. That was all I had. And my recommendation always, is, and this is purely my recommendation. There's a million ways that you can get the data. I always select my geography first. Because I, I believe then that what what becomes available is what's available for that geography. The system is not going to send me on a wild goose chase. So I would recommend that you start with geography first. If it works for you, continue to use it. If you have a better way, use it and call me and tell me. No, no, no. I think that that was the key because I could not find the track tool. That's what was frustrating me. But it was because I did not pick my geography first for it to get specific about a track. So, right. I mean, uh, I, and, but I will keep your information because uh, you're right. This was a lot of information. I can't wait to review the data myself. Again, um, I'm certain I'm glad you're entertaining phone calls because sometimes I get anxious and I, it's hard to wait for an email later. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're thank welcome. you, ladies, for your time. All right. Have a good day. Me too. Our Bye. next question comes from Cecilia. Your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. I'm so excited about everything um, and very excited about the new census coming out. I, um, I'm not a statistician, but I study city planning, so I use it occasionally. So it will be um, very interesting to see uh, when the new census comes out and we actually have more accurate numbers to changing neighborhoods that sometimes mm -hmm. in smaller communities, I guess, can't really be measured with the ACS. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Well, it's mostly one question, but um, I, I need to ask like several questions about the availability of data and how to access it for two studies that I'm trying to conduct. And I'm wondering, you know, what is the best way to finding someone that I could ask specific questions? Why don't you give me a call offline? Okay. And then I'd be more than glad to walk you through that. Great. Is there any particular time that works well? Uh, if you call me about, and if you want to call today, call me about half hour after the webinar is over, and we'll be okay. able to, um, to chat. Okay? Great. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Debbie. Your line is open. Yes, hi. Um, hi. My name is Debbie Love, and I am a city planner. And many times um, when you are doing analyses, data that you need uh, runs over a variety of census tracts. Um, what is the best method, and I know I've used it, you know, a certain type of method, um, but what would be the best best method using your tool to um, carve out uh, or to uh, call out data that's specific to the area when it overlaps census tracts? Did you understand my question? So, uh, yeah, so you have... So you're looking like for a neighborhood. So let's just make believe you're looking for a neighborhood that has several census tracts in it. Yes. Or you or you're looking for an area that you only want one census tract. Well, um, here in, I'm in South Florida, and we have an um, in Miami-Dade County. We have multiple census tracts that run over um, jurisdictions and runs outside the jurisdictional lines. So some of it, right. um, some of the 
census tract may be in another city or some of the census tract may be in the unincorporated area. So how do I call out just the data from that census tract that's applicable to my community? But what's so the best when you yeah, when you're looking for geography, mm -hmm. it'll give you census tracts within, you know, Florida. And yeah. then it'll it'll also give you the option of census tracts partially within Florida. You might oh. want to select the partially because it's only going to give you data for the Florida portion. Right. Okay. But that's not helping me when I'm trying to, to not pull in the population of another area, um, and I only want the population or the demographics of that census tract within my particular community. Right. So when you select partially within Florida, uh -huh. it's only going to give you the data for the part of the census tract that's in Florida. That's in my city. Mm -hmm. Right, your city or your state, or however it is. Okay. So it's partial, so it's only going to give you the data for those that are partially located inside of it. Oh, okay. Um, and when I go to geography, and my apologies because I was making notes. Oh, please don't apologize. Please don't apologize. <laughs> um, I'm still looking at. Um, when I go to the census tract and then I go to geography and I click on, I mean census, and I click, click on the geography program, it gives me about interactive maps and then geographies. Are we looking at the interactive maps or the geographies? No, I'm actually looking at either, uh, and right now I would not recommend that we go to the American Fact Finder because it's going to be retired pretty soon. So go to our new data tool, data.census.gov. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and there you can select in your advanced search, in your single bar search, your simple uh -huh. search, you might want to say something in whatever uh -huh. county in Florida, and that will bring up some data for you. Oh, or if you want to. I'm going to. I'm actually going to bookmark this sucker right now. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do an advanced search and put in a couple of queries. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then if I really um, get challenged, um, I thank you for the phone numbers. So again, thank you yep. so much. This is something that I, that we run into a lot here, um, mm -hmm. because we're. It's, highly urbanized and highly dense, so I appreciate that um, guidance. Thank you again. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Liz. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, you might have talked about this before I had to step away uh, to help a patron. Um, I'm a librarian, but when is all of the American Fact Finder usability is going to be into uh, data.census.gov, um, and is when is that actually going, is that transition taking place now, I know, or is it going to basically be when um, American Fact Finder uh, goes out at the end of March? No, it's actually taking place now, and the, and the goal is to have it, the data all transferred over uh, by June. The American you. Fact Finder, yeah, will be retired in March, as we said. You know, we have that banner on our website. Um, but they're working furiously to have all of the data that's available right now on American Fact Finder transferred over to data.census.gov, and then we'll start doing updates and all of that kind of stuff to um, the new tool. Okay. So you should have uh, you should have the data available to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our next question comes from John. Your line is open. Hi, my name is John. Um, I just have two questions related to the um, to the data. Um, how does the bureau or one? How does the bureau count or approach the homeless population? Or are there suggestions for city planners, regional planners? Um, to kind of get a more accurate number of this population. And then the second question is, 
Um, how does the Bureau identify the value of homes? So if you could kind of help me on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, um, for your first question, the homeless, we actually uh, do an enumeration of the homeless uh, in, in, and we partner with agencies that are serving the homeless so that we can do our count. And then there's an evening uh, that we go out specifically to count people who uh, we've been informed to congregate in specific locations, and we'll do that count. The thing is, you'll never see that count as homeless in anything that we produce. They're counted as the population of the geography where they're being counted, okay? Um, so if you were looking for how many people are homeless, we would not, you know, okay. separate that data. Yeah, I didn't think yeah, you so, did. I was just curious how you approached it. Right. Um, so, yeah, so we, we do an actual count. Um, and then your second question was, tell me again. Um, the second question was, how does the Bureau identify the value of homes? So um, as a regional planner, city planner, one of the things that I look at is the value of homes and uh, if they fall below certain thresholds, um, you know, whether they qualify for affordable or workforce, whatever term you want to use. Um, so I'm curious how, how that value is um, identified or collected. Um, is it from the survey going out to uh, the sample populations, and they just kind of check the box and say, "My house is between 200 and 300,000." How does that work out? I, 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 I'm, I'm almost positive it's the latter, but you know, it's something I want to verify rather than give you information I think and you know, and I'm not accurate about. So if you leave in the chat your name and your number, I'll get that information back to you. Okay, and should I just, um, I'll send it to you specifically in the chat, yeah. is that okay? You, you, you can send it to me or send it to Deb, because Deb, Deb is gathering all of the data, and then we'll send it to I, you. Yes, I am, John. Just go ahead and choose me and send that message privately to me directly. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Robert. The line is open. Yes, Anna Marie, a wonderful presentation. My question is around uh, business planning in terms of a business plan. I'm looking to identify a geographic area where I can open up a home care. Uh, so I'm looking for okay. specific specific customers that would uh, need this the, the services that will be provided for the elderly. Uh, so. Can you give me some direction? Sure, sure. I would recommend that you use the Census Business Builder, which I highlighted um, before, and use the uh, Small Business Edition. And then you can start searching for um, your potential market in a particular area, or you can look at it across the United States. But you might want to start in some geography that you have a desire in which to start and get some of the data there, which will tell you, wow, this area has, you know, 80% of people are above 60 years old. So that might be an area that you're interested in. And then you might want to look at health insurance coverage. So the things that might inform the development of your business and the situating of your business in that particular place. So Census Business Builder is where I would start. I think it's a very good tool for precisely okay. what you're looking to do. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Annette. Yes, hello. Hello. Hello? Yeah, thank you, Ana Maria, for everything. Um, I had a question on ancestry, um, which I understand uh, tries to collect data on ethnicity and up to two are used. For Puerto Rican, that assumes um, the three ancestries or ethnic groups that compose Puerto Ricans are taken into account as one. 
Well, people will identify themselves um, as Puerto Rican, and it's a self-identification, so we don't uh, add anything to it. So people will okay. identify that they're Puerto Rican, and then um, that that's you know where it's at right now. Okay. And I don't know if we'll be adding any subcategories to that. I haven't heard that as something okay. to potentially look out for. Perfect. Um, I had another um, question. When you were saying about the contact for the Puerto Rico Community Survey, did I hear correctly you would be a point of contact for that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So if it would be possible for you at some point to go back to your contact slide, because I did not get a chance to do a print screen so I can save your contact information then. You should see it now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Richard. Your line is open. Yes, uh, Anna Maria, thank you for taking my question. This is kind of kind of an opinion type question. Uh, since uh, over the last you know 20 years, you guys have stepped up uh, data collection. Is there any pushback from the general population with census taking of people that are more concerned about holding on to their privacy, like HIPAA and uh, things of that nature? People that don't want to uh, divulge information or are concerned that it may be used against them or uh, uh, fall into right. the wrong hands. You know, we, um, and I, I, I sort of alluded to this, but I didn't mention it, all of us who work for the Bureau take a, a lifetime oath, not like an oath just for doing our employment period, but a lifetime oath of confidentiality. So um, if we should ever divulge anything um, and, you know, and it becomes known, we're subject to a $250,000 fine and, five, and or five years in prison. So we're pretty, pretty serious about it. Um, and that goes across the board, and that is a message that's sent every time that we send out, uh, particularly during the census, um, information that we will not use. You know, and we demonstrate to people how the the, um, the data is actually published, and one never gets to identify. And we go through great lengths um, not to like if we're in a community and there's only one particular person of a certain race. We wouldn't um, we would suppress that data because we wouldn't want someone who's good at you know looking for that that information um, to be able to um, divulge the information. So we take great lengths to do it, um, but there still will be people who are concerned, and we try our best to alleviate their concerns, and we do that by working also with um, agencies that work with particular populations who might be concerned, who can then speak to the confidentiality issue at the Census Bureau. Yeah, one a particular uh, you know, example of that is like, for instance, an illegal alien or, or somebody that might be concerned about their uh, citizenship. Uh, they would be concerned that they would answer the census question on day one. On day two, ICE would show up at the door to, to pull them out, out the window, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, if I showed up, it's not because of the data that's covered uh, by uh, the Census Bureau, because that data would never be released. And on the census, we don't ask the citizenship question. We do ask it um, on the American Community Survey, and we've been asking it for some time. That sample data, again, doesn't identify who the individual is. Um, okay. So but you still, you're you're still trying take to, names, though, right? Well, you know, there's something that you might, might want to know. You know, people uh, complete the form and, you know, have their names, and the name file is immediately separated from the questions and the data responses, so there's no tying them together. Oh, I see. That okay. That's an important uh, piece. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's immediately separated, so while we get to, um, you know, tabulating all other responses, the names and, uh, and in some cases people give us their phone numbers is not used at all and is not released. Yeah. 
Because on, on old uh, census forms back in the old days, when, when uh, everything was like lopped onto one big long form, you had, you know, name, age, ethnicity, and uh, where you lived, and, and it was all together. You know, like if you're searching for uh, ancestry type stuff, you can find your long lost relatives that way. But uh, you're, what you're telling me now is everything's kind of separated out, so it can't be necessarily gleaned well, from one place. People can see the actual responses after 72 years. Okay. So after 72 years, we release, the, you know, you can see the form, and that's how you can find out and do all of your ancestry work. But it's not until 72 years. Then. Okay. Oh, okay. That, that's very important, too. Okay. Now, I, I think you've answered my question very well. So I'll Okay. Thank go. you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sergio. The line is open. Thank you for uh, today's uh, detailed information. I'm, I'm, my question in regards is to economic development uh, reports. Uh, I've browsed through the website and, and got a sense of what, what you're able to do through this call. My specific question is, as we pull a report, I, I see uh, majority of them are, are Excel-related. Uh, uh, I have not dived yes. beyond that. Is there an opportunity for it to be converted into infographics? Not at this point, and I don't know if that's going to be a feature that we introduce. Right now, it's um, in Excel. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question comes from Marianne. Your line is open. Hi, I have a question about drilling down and getting data from the block groups and the census blocks. Um, uh -huh. how, what's the easiest way to do that? Well, it, again, like I mentioned to the other person, you'd get, um, for your census blocks, it's only for decennial census. So right now what you would only be getting is 2010 census data. And that's Once fine. Okay, um, what you want to do is um, when you're looking for, when you're selecting geography, you'll want um, to select block and then respond to all the questions that they have, and it'll get you to the blocks that you're looking for. The same thing with block groups. You always have to... Even with, okay, so I would go and do the census track, the block group, and then the census block. I could drill if, if all the way down. Well, if you're looking for a census block, you first select census block, and then it's going to ask you, you know, where it's located and all. But you have to give it the indication of which um, geography you want to drill down to. So, it, you know, it's intuitive that you think that if you want to drill down, you start a census track, then go to block group and go to block. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Okay, I guess the problem is I'm having issues with drilling down to the census block. I can get to the tract and the block group, but I have issues getting any further. Are you inside of the American Community Service? Yes. Because if, right, so then you're never going to be able to drill down okay. to a block. And the lowest you can get is block group. Okay, so don't use ACS. Use the decennial census data. Right, right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our next question comes from Tanisa. Your line is open. Um, good morning. It's Tanisa Smith from Roxbury, Massachusetts, and my question is, as a beginner um, of using the census, how would you specifically find populations that are um, specifically Native American and also from um, 1970 to present, how would I find agricultural, farmland, um, and land use in specifically um, Massachusetts, Boston, particularly? So any data for 1970, um, any data before 2000 is not available on the tool. 
one would have to actually look through the the books that were produced for that data. And that's a pretty, pretty tedious process. But I do know that the, um, I believe it's the Minnesota, um, let me not say what it is because I'm not going to, I want to make sure I give you the right information. So if you put your question as well in um, the chat to Deb, I'll make sure that I give you that because uh, the Minnesota, um, I think it's Data Clearinghouse, has actually digitized all of the censuses uh, from 1790 to the present, right? And we have not. We, the Census Bureau, have not. So that's one place that you can get the data. Um, okay. And then the other question you asked me was for Native people. Um, if you go in and you look and specify um, Native Americans, you'll be given a host of tribes for which we collect data. The thing about that is that it's, it's actually people on the reservation, so sometimes some of that data might be suppressed because there's a small amount of, of people living in that area. But you can actually try, look for it by tribe. Okay. Also, what about the um, ACF? When when a Native American is like living in a community that is diverse, like in Boston, will we be counted individually or are we just grouped into, I'm not sure how are we counted? Well, you're counted as you identify yourself. Okay. So when, when you know, if, if you say American Indian, then you're given the opportunity to put in a tribe uh, and then you do that. Um, if you, you know, however else you're counted as a as, as part of the population, how you identify is dependent upon your response. Okay. And also land use, will I be able to find land use for the specific area geographically, for like Boston, of how the land was used currently and then in the past? I'm not so sure that we have that data available, but okay. I can ask headquarters if we do, and if we do, where can we find it? So in your question, just make sure that, that that's included so I can ask. Okay. Another thing with my questions, um, I was only able to log in through my phone and not on the site because I'm not sure why. I'm using my cell phone. Uh -huh. The login, so I don't think that it's compatible. I should have probably been on the computer, but it wasn't that one. So, how? So, so Deb, do you, do you Deb, do you want to give her a place that she can email to or something like that, so we can capture her question? Um, yeah, absolutely. If you'd like to uh, send that question directly to me, you can go to the chat feature and select my name, and just uh, let me know what I can do for. What's that? She's not. Oh, she's, she's not in the in the in, in the webinar. That. Yep, absolutely. Yep. One second here. So, if you'd like to contact me directly, I can give you my telephone number. Sure. Thank Are you. you able to write it down right now? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. My number is three zero one seven six three one two eight three. I'll be able to help you out. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, you're very welcome. That'd be awesome. Thanks so much for answering my questions. You're welcome. And uh, operator, before we take the next question, can you give us a count how many people we have in the queue right now? Or how many questions, I should say? I have nine questions in queue. Okay. Um, so I'm not really sure that we're going to be able to address all of the questions. If your question went unanswered, we ask that you please submit it through the chat. We will do our very best to get back to you within a reasonable time. We did have a lot of activity in the chat today, so thank you all for that. Um, and I think we can take one or two more questions, I would say, Anna Maria, or? Sure, that's fine. Okay, all right. We'll take two more questions, and apologies to everyone whose question went unanswered over the phone. but. Please use the chat feature and we'll get back to you, um, you know, within a few days. So thank you. Our next question comes from Milan Roy. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Good morning. And it was a wonderful presentation. 
Uh, my question here was, as one of the earlier um, questioners also said, that uh, how authentic is going to be the data, one. Second is, is there any difference between data and information? So first of all, what was the first question? How authentic is the data going to be? Yeah, the data collected will be how authentic, because Earlier, one speaker said that you know there may be some person who is a non-citizen, and you know something like that. So, how authentic will be the data collected? The data is the data is actually what's reported to us, and we encourage people to be um, truthful in their responses, but we don't check for authenticity of it. Okay. And the second question, if I could just know about it, that a couple of times it's been interchanged that this data and information. So are they two different uh, uh, things to be defined or they are the same? Uh, for, for us, it's data. It's what people provide to us and then we produce that. And then when people are looking at it, they, they sometimes say, oh, the information about this area is this. We will always use the data about this particular area is this. So for us, the data, data is what we've collected. So, so what I have concluded is that data is a collection of facts and figures, and information is processed to data. Am I okay? Information is what? Information you process is what? data. You work on the data to get the details. So that's called information is processed mm -hmm. to data, and data is just a collection of facts and figures. Information can include a lot of things, but for us, data is what we have collected and what we've processed. Okay. Thank you very much for the okay. response. You're welcome. Our last question comes from April. Your line is open. Hello. I am hello? curious. Yes, hello. I am curious yes. to several different issues. To keep things short, can the data go back to 1960 for topography? Uh, it probably could, could, but I have no idea where we can find it right now. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, I can request from headquarters if it is available and if it is available, where it is, and then relay that information to you. That would be fantastic. And you're interested in the topography, right? You said? Well, the topography was, I know we have laws about names and locations. And so if there's information about those locations being serviced, that would be fantastic if the service information is in the data. So you you think that there's some geography that we had at one time which doesn't show up now? Could be yeah. a name change. We I'll I'll find that all out for you, and then get back. Yeah, that's, yeah, building permits, all that, just generate. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. That's, yeah, we'll do that. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, Deborah, that should be our last question, no? Uh, yes, it is. So, um, Anna Maria, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We've just had really overwhelmingly positive feedback through the chat. So, thank you for taking time out of your day and your schedule to present for us today. Um, and before we conclude, I want to just very quickly mention that we are going to have a webinar next Tuesday, February 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And the topic for that will be the 2020 decennial operations. And the session will focus on how the 2020 census is different than it ever has before, uh, the online response, innovations in technology, so on and so forth. So we hope to see you there. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to learn more, you can visit census dot gov slash academy and go to the upcoming webinars tab to find the information there. So thank you all again for joining us today and thank you Anna Maria. You're welcome.
Thank you for your participation in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.